Good afternoon. Thanks to everyone who's attending this webinar. So I'm going to talk about MIL standard 461G. Um, I'm going to give an overview of, of the standard and then I'm going to uh, give some details on the, on the major changes and some other minor changes that are being proposed. Um, so I'll start with an overview where I'll go through basically uh, the entire standard and then I will be discussing specifically the changes that are being proposed for G. Um, so the, the draft version of G was released a, a few months ago and um, there could be other changes or the changes could be reverted back to the final version but right now this is what the uh, proposed version is. And then I'll, I'll briefly mention um, the latest update that I've received about the timing of implementation of the final version of G. And at the end, I'll also briefly um, go over MET's additional EMC capabilities. So first I want to discuss the reasons for performing MIL standard 461 testing. There's two main reasons and the most common reason is that it's a government contract requirement. So as a military contractor, if if you bid on um, a military contract to build something for the U.S. Department of Defense and you enter into a contract, they may list on your contract um, requirements that you have to provide a MIL standard 461 test report, which means you have to go through the testing and make sure it all complies and then provide a test report. So that's the most common reason. And the other reason has to do with marketing purposes. Um, you may see from time to time devices that are that are marketed as being MIL standard 461 ruggedized or designed. And um, it can be a useful standard even if you're not selling the equipment to the U.S. government or you're not required to do the testing because it is um, a stringent standard and if you can design equipment to pass this standard along with other environmental uh, standards, then it is good proof that your device is, is rugged and it's going to um, perform reliably under harsh conditions. So I'm going to go next and talk about the scope of the standard. The MIL standard 461 covers electromagnetic compatibility testing of systems and subsystems. It doesn't, it's not intended to test full platforms um, like a ship or aircraft or a military vehicle directly. It's more intended for the devices that are going to go on those platforms. Um, and it's used by the U.S. Department of Defense. So, any equipment that's being procured by any department of the U.S. Uh, military or even U.S. government other offices often require that electronic or electrical equipment be tested to MIL standard 461 along with other standards. And um, the requirements in the standard, the standard explains that they can be tailored based on operational and engineering analysis. So they do lay down specific test levels and requirements for um, equipment on certain platforms and for use by certain military uh, divisions. But beyond that, based on the detailed knowledge of a certain piece of equipment, it is allowed to tailor those requirements to more closely um, simulate the actual installation environment for a particular piece of equipment. And when, when there's tailoring that's going to be done that's usually based on the design engineer team, uh, their engineering judgment, and it would be detailed in a test procedure. And then that test procedure would be submitted to the Department of Defense or the procuring agency that's, you, you know, you're under contract with for their approval on those tailored requirements and those deviations from the, the standards. The, the standard is made up of a main body and an appendix, and I like to mention that because the appendix is a useful appendix in this case where they actually copy and paste the full content of the standard 
and then they add additional engineering uh, rationale of uh, why some of the requirements are the way they are in the standard. So that can be helpful in understanding um, and helping to interpret the standard. The test methods in Mill Standard 461 are um, named with a standard letter and number combination. So an example uh, is one of the tests is CE102. So the C stands for conducted and the E stands for emissions. In other tests you'll see an R which will stand for radiated or an S which will stand for susceptibility. Section 2 lists other applicable documents, so it, you know, it lists mainly references to other documents and standards. And then Section 3 gives definitions. Um, and then Section 4 is called general requirements. And I'll detail some of the general requirements that I feel are more, uh, more important and that actually need to be used each time that you test for the standard. So Section 4.3.1 talks about measurement tolerances. And they, they give uh, tolerances on distance. So when they talk about the test setup, and you'll see as I go on, um, some of the parameters of the test setup require that the cables are isolated um, off of the ground plane and that the cables are stretched out for certain lengths. So the tolerance on all those parameters is going to be 5%. And then um, for frequency measurements, 2%. And then for the amplitude of the measurement receiver, 2%. Um, and these will all be used and applied by test engineers who are performing these tests when they're deciding um, how much tolerance they have on their measurements. Section 4 also has quite a bit of detail about test chamber shielding, um, the RF absorbers, and the ground planes that are required for the, the test setup. 4.3.6 talks about the power source impedance and the fact that you need to use LISNs for all the tests. The LISN is an acronym for Line Impedance Stabilization Network. The two figures at the bottom of this slide, the left bottom shows the, the basic schematic for the LISN. Um, LISNs are something that are used in, in all types of EMC testing, so commercial standards like CISPR standards, NCC 63.4, FCC Part 15 testing. Normally some of the tests require LISNs, um, but there's a, variety of, there's a variety of LISNs that could have slightly different components. The MIL standard 461 is very specific. They want you to use LISNs that have the specific components shown here. And that helps for test repeatability. Um, the purpose of the LISN is to establish a 50 ohm impedance. And that also provides for test repeatability from one lab to another. Um, and, it, and it also is a value that's selected because it could, be, it, is, it is a close value for some real life scenarios. You know the power source and something lower in the in the Hertz range, usually. And um, the other benefit of, of establishing the 50 ohm impedance is that they include a measurement port there in parallel to some of the components that you can connect directly to the spectrum analyzer, which is also a 50 ohm impedance measurement instrument, and and that provides an impedance match. So that is one less. Um, correction type of correction factor that you'll have to worry about since you have an impedance match there. So the bottom right figure shows the impedance curve of the LISN. Um, and it, you know, they call them 50 ohms because they're designed to approach 50 ohms across as much of the frequency range 10 kilohertz to 30 or to 10 megahertz as possible. But you can see that below um, about three or 400 kilohertz, the impedance actually rolls off down to um, down towards it looks like about five or six um, ohms at 10 kilohertz. So when we do conduct an emission CE 102 and we take measurements off the lizard, there is a correction factor that we need to apply to the to the results in the range between 10 kilohertz up to 
um, approximately two megahertz, or I'm sorry, up until approximately two or three hundred kilohertz, where the um, impedance is flat at close to 50 ohms. The next slide just has a photograph from a couple different angles of the um, lizens. They're pretty simple looking devices. They're usually contained in a steel chassis um, and just to make it a solid um, Faraday cage design. And the port in the center is usually the place where you pass through one of the power conductors of your equipment under test. There would be one lizen for each conductor in in your power cabling, your input power line. And then you can also see there's another port on the lizard. And that's a, um, in this case, it's an N, a type N RF port. And that would be the measurement port where we would connect the um, spectrum analyzer to that in order to take CE102 measurements. And then the other port, you can see the diagrams, look, the picture's a little blurry, but the bottom right port is actually just a, um, it's a stud. So it's a ground stud. It's directly connected to the chassis, so it can be used for grounding the uh, lizards to the bench. Um, also in section 4, in section 4.3.8, they describe the EUT test configuration. So section 4, again, is just the general section of the standard, and it applies to all the test methods for the most part. So the figures that are shown in this section are the basic setup that's used for all the test methods in those standard 461. And I decided to show figure two, the general test setup in the presentation, because that's the most common test setup that applies for most of the equipment under test that, that we see on a regular basis. Um, and it's the setup that would be used for any device that's normally mounted to some type of grounded portion of the platform, whether it's a ship plane uh, or vehicle. And in the diagram, you can see the cube there. They represent as the equipment under test, EUT. And they're showing that the equipment external cables, the equipment under test external cables have to be stretched out for two meters at the, along the front edge of the tabletop ground plane. Um, and then they have to be insulated five centimeters up height-wise off of the ground plane, and the individual cables should be separated two centimeters in between each cable. And there you see the lizens that I just um, talked about in detail. The, the ground plane has to be bonded to the chamber at various certain intervals, and the cable height has to be 80 to 90 centimeters high. There are, I think, five figures in this section, 438, and the other figures there um, are for other setups. One of the other setups is if you have, if you're testing something that will never be bonded or never be placed on a ground plane type of surface in the, in the real use, then you wouldn't use a table that has a full-size ground plane. You would use a non-conductive table that only has a small ground plane for the lizards. And if you're testing uh, floor standing equipment, equipment that normally is resting on the deck of a platform, then it gets placed on the floor of the chamber during testing. And there's a, there's a few other specific um, setups that are shown there, too, that I, that I didn't include here. Section 5 is called Detailed Requirements, and it is made up of individual sections for each test method. And this is the overall list of test methods that could uh, possibly be included. For, for nearly all, all programs or all projects, um, only a subset of test methods are applicable to a single device. So this is the overall list. And um, I'm going to get into the details of the, of the individual test methods on later slides. Another table that's included in Section 5, it comes right after Section 5.3, is the requirement applicability table. So this table is used by um, the Department of Defense, and it's also used by MET labs and other test labs when we are asked to decide which tests we consider applicable for a certain device. So we would look at what platform um, the equipment is installed on and 
sometimes within each platform it's broken up into the different military branches and then we'll follow across and consider all of the test methods that are marked with an A as applicable. All of the test method methods that are marked with an L, we would go to the detailed section of that procedure and um, look at the applicability criteria to determine if it's applicable. And then the ones that are marked with an S are only applicable if the procuring activity specifies that. So they use the term procuring activity a lot throughout Mill Standard 461 and they're, they're referring to the particular um, party within the military, within the U.S. military that is, is responsible for the contract. In Section 6 of Mill Standard 461, it's titled Notes, they talk about data item description documents. These are separate documents um, that are not contained within Mill Standard 461 that detail procedures for the overall test plan, which they call the interference control procedure, and then the interference test procedures, which would be basically the test procedure that would be specific for EMC testing, and you would prepare that detailing which tests you're going to perform and any deviations or tailoring and submit that to the um, procuring activity for approval prior to testing. And there's also 80200, which is detailing the test report and the format and what types of information need to be included in the test report. Some, some military contracts on the DD form 1423 or other similar um, contract forms will list these documents specifically. And if they do, um, I recommend that you relay that information to your test lab so they know that there's a certain format required for the test report. Also, MetLabs offers to prepare the test procedures on behalf of our clients. Um, and usually that service is desired um, when it's basically a time saver or um, if you don't have the proper engineering resources, you could contract Met to put that together. It still would involve um, quite a bit of effort from from the design team to provide the information that's needed to MetLabs, but MetLabs would be able to put it into the standard format that's required by the CID document. This um, web link here is a link to a website that's, or, that's controlled by the U.S. government that has access to a lot of mil, mil standards, um, military standards, and the uh, draft version of mil standard 461G is available there. And those are all free standards, but they're limited to unclassified documents. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the individual test test methods, and I've grouped them together. Um, I won't. This this type of webinar doesn't. It isn't the right, I guess, uh, amount of time to get into all the details of every test method. So what I'm going to do is um, summarize the test methods and then give more detail on the new test methods that are proposed in in the G draft. So first, for summarizing the test methods, I'm going to go through the conducted emissions test. So all the tests that start out with the CE, which stands for conducted emissions. So the conducted emissions tests are um, CE 101, which is lower frequency, and it's done by placing a, an inductive current probe around the input power lines of the EUD, and that input current probe gets so that uh, inductive current probe gets connected to the input of a spectrum analyzer and it's checking to see if the emissions that are generated uh, unintentionally back out of that power input port of your equipment are below the limits that are set forth in the standard for the, for the RF current. CE-102 is in a little bit higher frequency range. So CE-101 I believe is from 30 hertz up to 100 kilohertz or 150 kilohertz, and then CE102 is from 10 kilohertz but extends all the way up to 10 megahertz. And CE102 is a voltage measurement, 
And as I mentioned earlier, that's taken off of the LISN RF measurement port. So a coaxial cable is connected from the RF measurement port on the LISN to the input of a spectrum analyzer, and the RF uh, voltage emissions are, are scanned and, and checked against the limits set forth in the standard to control the emissions unintentionally um, coming out of those on those power lines in a conducted fashion. CE106 is specifically for antenna ports, so that test is only applicable to transceiver type equipment that has a, an, an actual antenna port with a removable antenna. And in that case, the spectrum analyzer is connected to the antenna port of the equipment under test. Oftentimes, we have to, in line with that connection, there's some type of filter or attenuator to protect the spectrum analyzer from the, any intentional signal from the equipment under test. And um, we're, we're checking to make sure that the RF emissions coming out of the antenna port that are out of band are below the limits set forth in the standard. So in the two photographs that I've included, um, these are typical, typical setups for conducted emissions. These both look like they're from CE102 because I can see that the spectrum analyzer is connected to the LISN measurement port. Um, the figure on the or the pic photograph on the left shows the calibration setup, and each test in Mill Standard 461 requires a test system calibration to be performed each time that we perform the test. So before we actually start taking measurements off of the EUT, first we have to follow the procedure detailed in the standard, which checks our test equipment to make sure that our test equipment is performing properly. In the calibration for CE-102, a signal generator is used to apply a known, a calibrated signal generator to apply a known level into the LISN, and then we're, we're measuring that level with our spectrum analyzer to ensure that we're measuring the correct frequency and amplitude. And an oscilloscope is also used to make sure that the sign, um, that the waveform of the signal is sinusoidal, and it's not getting distorted by any of the, the LISN circuitry or other test equipment. Then in the right figure, that's a test setup photo where the signal generator has been taken out of the chamber and the um, measurement is now being performed with the EUT powered through the LISN. So any emissions that the EUT is generating out of its power ports would be measured on the LISNs that are in line with the power. There's a number of conducted susceptibility tests in mill standard 461. CS101 is more like uh, audio frequency range conducted susceptibility, and that's done by using a signal generator into an audio amplifier, and then a transformer is used to couple that energy onto the power lines by putting the output of the audio amplifier in series with the primary of a transformer and placing one of the single power line conductors in series with the secondary of the cup, test equipment coupling transformer. CS1034 and 5 are rarely performed tests. They're only done when, when um, specified by the procuring activities for a specific contract. And they're also antenna port tests, so they would only ever be applicable to transceiver type of equipment. And they simulate different disturbances arriving at the antenna port. And um, we're, for all these tests that we call susceptibility tests, we're making sure that when we present the disturbances to the equipment under test, the equipment under test is going to perform properly. Um, it's going to per perform its intended functions without being interfered with by the disturbances we're presenting. CS109 is also a rarely performed test. It's only applicable for equipment that has a, a certain sensitivity of measurement circuit included. And um, it's a structure current test, so we inject the disturbance onto the ground and we lift the ground grounding of the EUT so that um, it simulates that there was noise on the ground structure. CS114 is radio frequency range uh, conducted susceptibility. 
if anyone's familiar with the commercial testing for 61000-4-6, it's very similar to that. Um, an, an inductive bulk current injection probe is used and placed around each of the power lines as well as any external signal lines. And a signal generator and an amplifier is used to drive that bulk current injection probe to inject the energy onto the EUT line. And um, we sweep through the fre large frequency range on that test. CS115 is a specific type of in, uh, transient impulse spike. CS116 is a damp sinusoidal transient spike disturbance. And then the two new tests that are proposed for G are CS117, which is conducted susceptibility lightning induced transients, and CS118, conducted susceptibility personnel borne electrostatic discharge. Um, on this slide, I've just included some conducted uh, susceptibility test equipment and setups. So in the bottom left corner, there's a rack of equipment that we typically use for CS114 testing. It contains an RF signal generator, a spectrum analyzer for monitoring the um, injected signals, and also a power meter for monitoring the injected signals. And then it has a RF amplifier at the bottom there. Um, for CS114, we have to monitor both the current and the power, and there's limits set for both, because based on the impedance of each individual external EUT cable under test, um, there may be more power or more current induced onto the line, so there's a limit set forth to control uh, both, both levels. The center setup here shows a calibration setup for either CS115 or 116, they both look very similar. Um, and in this diagram, there's, a, there's an oscilloscope sitting on top of the transient generator. And you can see that the output of the transient generator is connected to a bulk current injection probe. And the output or the input of the oscilloscope is connected to a monitoring probe. Actually, this is the test setup photo because these probes are around the EUT cable. During the calibration, there would be a a calibration fixture here, which is just a coaxial test jig that opens the shield and allows you to place the probes around the center conductor of the coax. On the right side is one of the two um, lightning test systems that, that we own. This is the solar electronics lightning test system. It's a modular test system, so these modules can plug in for the various waveforms, and it includes a large variety of different coupling probes and other um, other fixtures that are needed for that test. So I'm going to come back later on later slides to give more details about those tests because those are those are the test methods that are newly proposed to be included in version G of MILF standard 461. So the next group of tests are radiated emissions type tests where we're going to measure the emissions that are generated by unintentionally, and some of them are intentional requirements, um, through the air from the EUT. So RE101 is the magnetic field radiated emissions test. That's a low frequency test from approximately 30 hertz up to 100K, 100 kilohertz. And um, that test is done with a loop antenna. And the loop antenna is placed in close proximity and scanned over the entire surface of the EUT. And we're ensuring that any magnetic emissions unintentionally generated by the equipment under test are below the limits set forth in the standard. RE102 is the electric field radiated emission. A lot of times when, when anyone in the industry just refers to radiated emissions, RE102 or any electric field type of test is mainly what uh, the main concern is. It tends to be one of the more difficult tests to, to pass. Um, and for electric fields, we're testing from anywhere from 10 kilohertz up to 18 gigahertz. So it covers a very wide frequency range. And we have to go through a bunch of different antennas in order to cover that frequency range. The uh, di diagram on the right bottom of this slide shows three of the, the different antennas that are used. So there's a rod antenna, which is used from 10 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. 
and then there's a biconical that's used from 30 megahertz to 200, and then the double ridge horns, um, there are different sizes of those. We have large ones that we use from 200 megahertz to 1 gigahertz, and smaller ones that we use from 1 to 18 gigahertz. Another, the other uh, radiated emissions test that's in the standard is RE103, which is for antenna, spurious, and harmonic outputs. So this test is only applicable for um, transceiver type equipment that has some type of radio or receiver. And it's not the preferred test method for testing for this type of emission. The preferred test method is CE106 that I already mentioned earlier. However, if the antennas are not removable, so that we, uh, the antenna is embedded or the antenna is permanently connected and there's no port that you can remove the antenna from, then it, it basically isn't possible to do the conducted emissions CE106 style test. So RE103 is provided as a test method for equipment that has embedded antennas, non-removable antennas, or if the antenna itself has some type of circuitry built into it and it needs to be tested, um, then RE103 is used. The test method is similar um, to CE106 in that we still have to scan through the entire frequency range, only this time we're using antennas as our transducer instead of uh, connecting a cable directly to the EUT antenna port. And again, in RE103, we have to use filters, directional couplers, or um, attenuators, whatever it takes in order to protect the input of our spectrum analyzer from any intentional radio signal generated by the equipment under test. So the diagram on the left bottom of this slide um, is one of the it's called the basic setup out of the standard. And it just shows that the basic setup is to have a measurement receiver connected to uh, an antenna, which is pointed at the equipment under test. For the measurement equipment calibration check, we temporarily disconnect the antenna and just connect a signal generator to sweep the test table to make sure the test equipment is, is in good working order. This is a photograph of an actual piece of equipment we tested at MetLabs. And this is an example of the, the setup for RE102 and RS103 because from the antenna, uh, it, the setups look the same. So this, this equipment was a hydraulic power supply that's used for testing the um, wing rotation on the V-22 Osprey. Uh, aircraft before takeoff. So the V-22 Osprey is the, the aircraft that has the wings with propellers and they can rotate up and it has like a helicopter type of operation for takeoff and landing and the wings can rotate forward um, for more like typical propulsion. The next and last category of tests that are included are radiated susceptibility tests. RS101 is for magnetic field radiated susceptibility. And this test is done by using a small loop to radiate a magnetic field. Um, and that loop's placed in close proximity to the EUT. And it has to be placed every 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter square surface area on each surface of the EUT as we sweep through the, the frequency range, which is approximately 30 hertz up to 100 kilohertz. And again, since these are susceptibility tests, we're monitoring to make sure that the equipment under test performs properly while it's being subjected to these disturbances. RS-103 is the radiated susceptibility test for electric fields. And as with RE-102, um, RS-103, when if someone generically refers to radiated susceptibility, they're probably talking about RS-103 or a similar, similar test. This test is somewhat similar to the commercial test that's detailed in IEC 61000-4-3, although the, the range of test levels tend to be much higher and more stringent, um, and the step sizes are smaller, so the test takes longer. RS-105 
radiated susceptibility transient electromagnetic field is a test that simulates electromagnetic um, pulse weapons, so EMP uh, bombs and similar disturbances. On this slide, the photograph on the right bottom side is one of the more unique antennas that we use when performing RS-103 uh, in the very low frequency range in order to achieve 200 volts per meter field. And the diagram that's shown on the bottom left of this slide, um, it shows the test equipment configuration for RS-103. So you can see a signal source connected to an RF amp amplifier and the output of the amplifier into an antenna. So that signal source and RF amplifier are driving that antenna to generate a field and subject that equipment under test to that RF field. And then on the bottom right side of the diagram, you see um, they're showing any simulation or monitoring equipment that the EUT has. For all of the tests that I mentioned that are susceptibility tests, um, there's usually equipment provided by our clients that will allow us to monitor, simulate, and then monitor the normal performance of the equipment um, from outside the chamber. And then there's also a, an electric field sensor display here. Usually that's a computer with software, and that's connected to an isotropic field probe that's placed inside nearby to um, monitor and, and feedback what is the field strength that we're generating. The next slide shows a photograph of a uh, large setup that we had to do for RS-105 EMP testing. We attempt to do this test in our test chambers when the clearances are met, but since there's a requirement that the top of these radiating wires have to be three times as high as the equipment under test, um, in many cases these tests are done outdoors. And, a, and actually the standard and a lot of the equipment manufacturers for this test recommend that it's the preferred method to do these tests outdoors because the chamber is called reflections and it's, if you don't have a lot of clearance off of the chamber walls, then it's, um, the reflections will distort your waveform. However, it is there are dip, uh, separate difficulties with doing the test outdoors because it's a strong field. They have to respect clearances even when outdoors for personnel and other electronic equipment so that it doesn't damage any um, anything. In this, in this setup, um, there would normally be cars parked here, but we had to move all the cars so that we didn't damage any electronics in the cars. Um, we purchased this test generator um, and we built this fixture for these wires in the case of this test. Um, RS-105 generates a 50,000 volt per meter pulse field, and that field is uh, designed to simulate the approximated value that would be generated on the ground if, an, if a nuclear weapon was detonated high in the atmosphere, and it's expected that it would produce a 50,000 volt per meter pulse field on the surface, uh, Earth's surface. And that, that level is high enough that it would induce voltages onto circuit traces at a high enough voltage that they would physically damage a lot of electronic components and then render uh, those electronics uh, inoperable. So the next series of slides I'm going to get in a little bit more detail on the main changes in version G. So one of the main changes is they removed the test method, and that was CS106. CS106 was actually developed and added under the previous version, S, and it was based on a test in a much earlier version, CS06, which was present in versions A through C. Um, and they didn't really provide any rationale in version G of why the test was removed. But there are several other um, transient type voltages voltage uh, disturbance tests now that are included in CS117 and there also have all have always been other transient disturbance tests and other test methods so maybe that's perhaps why it was moved um, and from this when you're reading through the standard and you get up to the section for CS106 after that um, because it was removed then the section numbers would no longer match up so if you're trying to compare 
versions. Um, and if I talk about section numbers from this point forward, you know, it's just important to make sure you're keeping track of what version you're talking about there. Um, the other big change is that they've added the test method that they numbered CS117, and that's a lightning simulation. CS117 is based on an existing test method, which is under the standard RTCA D0160. RTCA D0160 is the electric, well, it's the environmental standard that includes environmental and electromagnetic compatibility for commercial aircraft. And so this test method has basically been adopted in the mill standard 461. Um, they have they have tailored it a bit, but it's largely based on that test method. This test is marked as applicable for aircraft and surface ships for above deck equipment. And um, it includes waveforms 1 through 6 from, from RTCA D0160 with the exclusion of 5B. Um, it also includes test, different test levels for internal and external equipment, meaning if your equipment is going to be installed internal or external to the platform in the installation. And the application method that's used is clamp injection. So it's inductive, um, inductive probes are clamped around the EUT cables. And then the various wave disturbance waveforms are injected onto the equipment cable. RTCO D0160 has clamp injection as well as pin injection. And Mill Standard 461 has not included um, pin injection in the draft, draft version of G. The, the next slide shows the uh, calibration and test setups for CS117. And you can see that a transient generator is connected to an injection transformer to during calibration couple that disturbance onto what we call a calibration loop, with this, which is just a loop of wire. And then an oscilloscope and voltage and current probes are used to monitor um, or measure the disturbance and make sure that the waveform parameters like rise time, amplitude, and, and things like that are um, as specified in the standard. And once the calibration is performed, then the test setup is set up as per this diagram where the calibration loop is removed and the injection transformer is placed around the interconnecting cables of the equipment under test. And the levels that were set at the generator during the calibration are applied to inject that disturbance onto the equipment under test. And again, since this is a susceptibility type test, the equipment under test is monitored to make sure that it's performing properly during these disturbances. Now, I haven't included all of the waveforms and other details for this test since it wouldn't fit into the time frame here. Um, and also because this test is somewhat unique in the number of waveforms and the, and the complexity of the test method. Um, it's quite a complex test method compared to the others. The next change that's considered a, a major change is the addition of another test to the G version uh, draft proposal, and that's CS1, they've numbered that test CS118 for ESD, electrostatic discharge. CS118, uh, it's titled as Personnel Born Electrostatic Discharge, is based on IEC 61000-4-2. Basically, no, no major deviations um, from that standard. They've just adopted IEC 61000-4-2 with some minor clarifications. Um, IEC 61000-4-2 is applicable to equipment with a man-machine interface, meaning that a human being is going to actually interact with the equipment by touching the equipment in order to operate it. That's, the, that's what this test simulates is um, the electrostatic charge that's built up on the human body and then the, the, the transfer of that charge to electronic equipment. So everyone is familiar with this when you get a, a electrostatic shock on your like car door on a cold, dry day. That's exactly what we're simulating with the um, test generator for, for this test. We're applying that type of shock to the equipment under test and we're trying to figure out if that 
type of electrostatic discharge is going to cause interference of the operation of the equipment under test. So the mill standard 461 has clarified the test levels that um, are to be used, which is for contact discharges up to plus and minus 8,000 volts, and then air discharges actually are only applicable if if specified by the procuring activity for a particular contract. So normally we would, in a lot of cases, we would only be doing the contact discharge. And um, this test, just like all the other tests in Mill Standard 461, requires calibration of the test equipment prior to performing the test. And in this case, it requires that you use an electrostatic voltmeter to measure the amplitude and um, an oscilloscope with the Pellegrini target like is described in IEC 61004-2 for measuring the rise time and uh, current of the waveform. Now I'm going to go through some other miscellaneous changes. In section 4.3.8.6.1, interconnecting leads and cables, um, they added some clarification. And in particular for freestanding equipment, they now include a table for routing the cables, where in the previous versions of the standard, those cables were routed down to the chamber floor. Um, so it's just, you know, uh, an interesting change to note. And it could cause some complications for some smaller chambers, because now you would, a lot of times, floor freestanding equipment that's was designed to normally be placed directly on the deck of a platform that is physically larger equipment in the first place. So now, in addition, you need enough room to place a table next to the equipment inside the chamber that allows for the, the two meters of um, interconnecting cable to be stretched. Another change is for CS114 in the test setup section. Um, I'm sorry, in the calibration setup section, they've um, clarified that you need to use two calibration fixtures now. So in the diagram they show, in the previous version, you only used one calibration fixture. Now you use two, and one of the calibration fixtures is used for the injection probe, and the other is used for the monitoring probe. Another change to CS114 is that they've allowed um, for the scans during the calibration to reduce the dwell time and increase the step sizes so that the calibration can be completed in a faster amount of time. Um, this is for, for anyone who's worked on conductive susceptibility tests, just kind of a common sense um, change because of the fact that there's no real benefit to doing very tiny step sizes and longer dwell times for a calibration that's just to um, establish the test levels that are needed. And since all the equipment is designed to operate fairly linearly within its within its bandwidth, within its frequency range, um, you can take larger step sizes and use a mathematical function to linearly interpolate the levels in between those step sizes for the purpose of actually applying the um, test to the equipment under test. A couple other changes. Um, for RE102, the applicability has been changed. The previous versions allowed you to limit the highest frequency of tests uh, based on the highest intentionally generated frequency within the EUP, such as like a, the highest clock or oscillator frequency. And they've removed that those wording. So they've removed that wording. So now it seems that all tests need to be performed up to 18 gigahertz. Also, um, for radiated emissions, freestanding equipment, the antenna heights need to be determined in accordance with um, these sections that I've listed here. And in those sections, they've made a single word change that results in a pretty drastic change for larger equipment, and that's they changed the word width to area. They used to say that you need to move your test antenna from left to right across the chamber in, in enough positions so that the beam width of the test antenna will fully illuminate the, the width of the EUT. And now 
they use the word area, so that means that in addition to doing additional antenna positions from left to right, you also need to consider doing additional test positions height-wise, so up and down on the antenna span um, for taller EUT. So basically, this can result in a longer test since additional test um, positions of the test antenna will be required for larger equipment. And then the exact same change is made for the RS-103 test method for the susceptibility test where you have to use an up antenna position to cover the entire area of the EUT with the beam width of the antenna, not just the width. So the latest update I have on the timing of implementation of MIL standard 461G is that it is expected to be released by the end of this year. And I actually followed up on that um, more recently, I would say about two weeks ago, and I forgot to update this presentation. But at that time, they still anticipate the release by the end of this year. And um, that's a, a pretty credible update because I got that update from someone that's on the North Standard 461 committee. So just a few slides to touch on MetLab's um, additional mil military EMC capabilities. Um, we do have the ability to test for all the versions and all the test methods within um, MIL standard 461G um, or within MIL standard 461 including the G version and at all the test levels that are, that are required there. And we're also equipped to handle, already equipped to handle the new methods that are proposed to be added, um, the lightning and the ESD test. We also have the ability to test to the commercial aircraft equipment standard, RTCA D0160. Uh, we do quite a bit of shielding effectiveness measurements of sheets of material as well as enclosures, small and large enclosures. We've tested chassis and, and also anything up to like chambers. And we also test through the whole series of different military power quality standards, uh, mill standard 704, 1275, and 1399-300. Those are test standards that um, are also required for most military electronic equipment to make sure they're going to properly utilize the power system within the platform they're going to be installed on. And then some of our equipment that we have that exceeds the capability of other labs, um, we have a 45 kVA programmable power supply and we also have proper RF filtering at the chambers to handle the full power of that power supply. Um, one of the unique sets of filters we have can handle up to 230 volts line to ground as well as at 400 hertz three phase. For, there's some special types of large uh, avionic equipment that need that type of power. And we have three chambers that are dedicated to the military and avionic EMC projects. Um, so we have separate chambers that are being utilized for commercial jobs and that's Basically, we were able to keep our lead time to zero on military testing. We also have a reverb chamber that can handle up to 20,000 volts per meter radiated susceptibility out at our Santa Clara, California facility. Um, so that can handle no, no standard 464 perf levels, can handle DO160, the highest uh, perf levels there. And herf is high intensity radiated field, so it's fields that are generated by uh, large, like high power transmitters on the surfaces of ships and at um, airports and different areas where you're going to have to operate very in very close proximity to the to the transmitters and the um, antennas transmitting those signals. We also can do uh, all the wave, waveforms and levels for the section 22 lightning test and as I mentioned earlier we can we can perform the RS-105 um, high altitude electromagnetic pulse testing up to 50,000 volts per meter. I think we can actually go higher, but that's what's required by a middle standard 461. So that's about all that I had. I'm going to check and see if there's any questions, and if, and if you do have any questions and you haven't typed them in yet, please uh, feel free feel free to do so.
Okay, so I have one question here that says, we are still required to test to Rev A. Will that ever be addressed? Um, yes, and I can give an explanation for that. It's always going to be the situation where military contracts can list and intentionally actually list older versions of MILF standard 461. The, the basic process that is supposed to be followed there is that if the equipment being procured under the contract is, is intended specifically for installation on an older platform, like a specific ship or aircraft or military vehicle, um, if the version of MILF standard 461 that was used at the time of design of all the equipment on that originally placed on that platform is documented, then they will require that you continue to test new equipment to that old version for any equipment that's going to be installed on that old platform that was designed to an older version. So that's, that's the answer for that. Um, I mean, I, I believe that, you know, that's the intended process and that's the way that it's going to continue to be. I haven't heard any talk of them changing that. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it because um, if they, if they don't do it that way, um, then there's going to be a mix of equipment on a platform, some of which was tested to different test methods and levels, and then it could lead to um, more electromagnetic interference and problems, and then a harder time to diagnose those problems. So the only other question was someone asked if, if you can download the document, the presentation, and that's and if we you can do that, and um, Sarah's going to let you know more details about that. So that concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. Tomorrow, an archived copy of the webinar will be available on metlabs.com. We will send a follow-up email with the link to this file. If you have any additional unanswered questions, feel free to contact us via phone or email. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today.